world is completely linked when it comes to energy markets. The, sometimes the coupling is weak, sometimes very, very strong. So deep and wide uh, markets which have lasted for a very long time with oil, uh, with certain imperfections, uh, are very different from the markets to do with natural gas uh, and uh, wood, for example. Uh, but uh, so every, every, every issue is linked around the world. Uh, and I think everyone is struggling on several points. One is the cost. You know, how do you maintain a sensible relationship between uh, consumption cost and GDP growth? How do you how do you actually maintain that? Primarily through uh, looking for lower cost sources, inherently cheaper sources of energy, which there are very few left, uh, and again technology. Uh, secondly, how do you diversify sources? Uh, to maintain a sense of security. Uh, after all, this is not a new idea. Uh, I think Winston Churchill was the first person to come up with this idea uh, that uh, it would be good to diversify sources because the more you diversified them, the more secure the supply would be. Uh, and the great man said so, and we've been saying the same thing ever since he said it, just in different forms. Uh, and the third then is clean. How do we make it cleaner? Uh, and the vex question of uh, the use of coal, in particular in places where it is the cheapest form of energy, uh, notably China. Uh, and finally, it is secure delivery, which is, means the, in, the world interconnected has to remain secure and safe, so there are problems uh, offshore, uh, of, offshore Africa with piracy and all sorts of things like that, that have, and Straits of Hormuz and the mm -hmm. concerns we have about whether that will be blockaded, unlikely, but there's always concerns. So th these, I think, are all the same issues. Overlaid with that, I think, in, in the, what you might call the heavily developed world, is the challenge of getting, how do you get people to think about a national objective <coughs> when it impinges on their local sense of well-being? So this is the problem with fracking. So it is about that. I mean, uh, that's dressed up with lots of different ways of thinking. It's about te techniques to do with preserving the environment. Can we frack in small stages without creating earth tremors? You know, how do we deal with effluent water? All, all these sorts of things. But actually, it's about the balance of national objectives and local interests. Uh, and uh, that's a, a tough one. Uh, to square. People have to see it, and it's not, I think, just about the pocketbook. Strangely, as, as many people know, there have been these great behavioral experiments where, you know, if, if you ask people to do something for the nation, they'll probably do it. And then if you go back and ask them the same question and pay them, half of them say no, uh, because they actually they get insulted uh, that actually the, the, the purpose has become a lower purpose. So, so it's complicated. But the, the problems are the same. When I look at, but perhaps the United States may be an advanced laboratory for many of these issues. So if you take fracking, for example, it has changed uh, the face of, uh, the face of uh, energy supply in the United States. It produced a, a significant surplus of natural gas, inherent surplus, We're keeping the price at a very moderate level for, I think, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and it's produced a very large amount of uh, light oil that nobody really thought was there. Nobody really thought was there, and certainly couldn't be recovered at any, any, any reasonable price. So, as everybody knows, uh, the, uh, the increase in production in the United States uh, of oil has exactly offset all the oil shut in in Libya, Iran, and other places in the world. So it's, a, it's been a zero-sum game, but it's changed the risk profile hugely mm -hmm. uh, in the world. But, the, but what can be done here, and the resistance to what can be done, now has to be translated into Europe, the other part of the highly developed world, where there are opportunities to change the way energy supply uh, is developed. But 
all the bad news from the United States travels far faster than the good news. It always does. So everybody knows about uh, gas land. Everybody knows about uh, rigs in people's backyards. Everybody knows about earth tremors. Nobody knows about the fact that it's increasing GDP by half a percent a year. Uh, nobody knows that it's been reducing the balance of payments mm -hmm. significantly. People forget the hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, and we have to uh, now balance those messages to see if Europe can, in the face of potentially some threats to its energy security from Russia, uh, do the right thing and change its risk profile when it comes to energy. But I think overall the, the challenges are the same. The solutions are slightly different. And so in business, I built two lives. One, a business life where I was, as one of my friends said to me, I was using an English word, but it, it translates into American, very reserved. In other words, nobody could see behind me what I was. I just reserved all my everything other than pure business to myself. So I had a reserved life in business, and then I had a, a very limited and very secret gay life outside. And I thought this was great. When I was young, it was quite exciting. It was actually quite exciting. Sort of James Bond you know, <laughs> uh, uh, idea. Uh, and, and it stayed like that, of course. And when you get used to it, you carry on like that. You go up the ladder. It stays the same. And actually, you get to the point where you have invested so much energy and effort into these two lives that you are bound to keep them separate forever. And in fact, you can't let them come together because people would see that you had two lives and you don't want them to see you had two lives. Uh, and so for me, I, I did that, even though many people, I'm sure, said he's probably gay, but they had, they deferred to me and they were polite. No one ever said that to me. And actually, I never thought they thought it because I deluded myself into believing that two lives were there. So they rather came together in a, a crescendo of... Uh, activity when a former boyfriend of mine uh, sold a story to the uh, British tabloid press. And that started a, a four-month process of trying to keep that out of the press with injunctions which didn't work, a uh, huge, uh, uh, gigantic press uh, uh, um, uh, coverage of, uh, of when uh, the injunctions were lifted. Uh, I immediately resigned from BP and from the Goldman Sachs board. I just decided it was all too much to handle and it was time to start a different life. So that was a, an example of what was going on in business. So I thought I'd write a book which said you really shouldn't do this because if you're trying to do it even today, it'll probably end in tears. It really will end in tears because there's, it's impossible to keep these two things separate forever. And it may not be healthy for you. Uh, and then I also said, but actually, it may not be very good for business either. If you have uh, hidden lives, there are <coughs> hidden costs to them.